ETSD Chartered Institute for IT. Uh, my name is Brian Ritzman. I'm the Head of Content and Insight. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, domestic abuse and the way tech uh, has um, been misused uh, in, in this context and uh, what might be done about it. Obviously, this is an important subject for BCS. It's about uh, making IT good for society. It's a tagline I'm sure you've seen from us uh, all over the place. And today we're going to speak to three experts that, that really know this area from three different perspectives as well. So that's absolutely excellent. And we'll look forward to them talking to us. I'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, I suppose a lot of this conversation comes around to unintended consequences, a little phrase that we use a lot today, often actually up until recent times in, in AI which has been raised in the public uh, awareness of uh, unintended consequences of uh, the kind of data that a system is trained on, that sort of thing. But it very much applies uh, also to this issue of uh, the way products are misused uh, by those that engage in domestic abuse. So that's why we're talking about this important subject. Uh, those that are attending live, probably most of you are watching this on video later, but those that are attending live, if you have questions, please do put them in. You know how to do this at this stage, I'm sure. There's a little Q&A section at the bottom. Put questions in there and we'll discuss them uh, as we go, uh, as and when appropriate. But now I'd like to um, just introduce uh, our participants one at a time. First of all, I'm gonna to come to Leslie Nuttall from IBM. Leslie, can you introduce yourself, uh, your job, uh, your interest in this area and so on, please, over to you. Sure. Thank you. So uh, my name is Leslie Nuttall and I'm a cyber security specialist at IBM. But the reason I'm here today is to talk about our work on coercive control resistant design, which is a framework of principles to help technologists build products from the ground up to resist attempts at manipulating it for control and abuse. Now, I just want to take a, a little step back and say a few words on innovation. There is, and has been for some time, a lot of focus on accelerating technological discovery. And sometimes designers and developers are so focused on the amazing achievements of their innovation that at first, they may not notice the downside to that invention. Technologies are neither inherently good nor inherently bad, but they can lead to good and bad outcomes. At its best, tech supports initiatives of all kinds, benefiting individuals, society, and even the planet. But at its worst, there are unanticipated consequences or even malevolent uses. And when it comes to domestic abuse, while the control that abusers exert isn't new, the tools that they use are, and perpetrators are adept at leveraging even the most well-intentioned of technologies to cause harm the very devices and technologies that were intended to support and protect us are being used to manipulate, isolate, spy on, undermine, embarrass, and scare. And as the number of internet connected devices grows and even more is shared online, this issue will only become more prevalent. So while we absolutely should be excited and hopeful about the potential of new technologies, we need to temper any optimism bias by recognizing that technology can be and is being manipulated for harm. And that is why conversations like this one are so important so that we can come together and figure out how to tackle this new form of abuse, hopefully improving the lives of some of society's most vulnerable people. Thank you very much, Leslie. Excellent introduction. We appreciate that. Now, let me move on to Leonie. Now, Leonie has a more academic uh, approach to this. So again, Leonie, if you can introduce yourself, um, your current role and uh, your interest in this particular area. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, it's, you know, very hard to follow up from Leslie because she basically already outlined the core issues that um, we, uh, from an academic research perspective, are also very, very interested in. So my name is uh, Dr. Leonie Tanzer. I'm a lecturer in international security and emerging technology at University College London. And we are running a small, well, I, I don't know if it's that small anymore, but like uh, it's running for a while now, but it initially started as a pilot study uh, called Gender and the Internet of Things, so gender and IoT. And we started initially off 2018 to um, examine 
the extent to which smart internet connected devices are being abused by domestic abusers in the context of internet partner violence. And very quickly through our work with the UK domestic abuse sector, we realized that IoT in itself is not the only technology we, we must have on our radar and that we really need to broaden our horizon to what I normally call conventional devices, so systems that we have for quite some time in our household, like smartphones, laptop, tablets, routers, um, and that we need to look at this issue holistically with IoT being something, and also artificial intelligence, something that is on the horizon that slowly is being misused, but is certainly not the bulk of abuse that is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation and, and sharing some of the insights uh, from an academic and research perspective. Lovely, thank you, Leonie. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we're gonna introduce uh, Emma Pickering as well. Emma's got a more of a societal uh, sort of approach to this. Emma, could you introduce yourself in the same way? Thank you. Of course. So I'm Emma Pickering and I manage the tech abuse team at Refuge. Refuge is the UK's largest provider of domestic violence services to women across the country. And the tech abuse team was formed in 2018 because we noticed a need on our impact database service where technology was being misused to stalk, harass and abuse victims. There's, um, we're a small team nationally and we all have individual specialisms and areas of focus. So we have an economic tech lead because we recognise that there is a clear crossover between economic abuse and online offences. We have a youth tech lead as well. We have a tech lead that specialism, specializes in disability and tech abuse as well. And my focus and area of research is Stalkerware and Spyware. We're part of the Stalkerware Coalition as well, where we look at trying to advocate um, and eradicate Spyware and Stalkerware um, on the App Store and Play Store, and also create research as well. Um, for frontline officers, we develop training packages for the police. Um, children's services, schools, colleges, etc., to try and raise awareness of tech abuse, what the term means, and what emerging trends that we see within our services. Thank you. Look Lovely. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. So, uh, in the uh, introductory uh, information we sent out when we uh, set this uh, webinar up, we were talking about the shorthand that we often use, which is um, digital um, uh, doorbells, isn't it? Um, doorbells with little cameras in. Uh, that uh, at first glance seem to be all about good, but actually can be quite easily uh, misused. So the first thing I'd like to talk to the panel about is just those products that we need to be uh, thinking about, Re perhaps recent examples of tech that, that more often gets misused in those contexts. Perhaps I could start with Leslie on that. Sure. So I find that sometimes the easiest way to answer that type of question is with a story. <laughs> so let me tell you about Tina, uh, a stay-at-home mom with two children who was recently split up from her partner. Now, Tina is a fictional character, but her story is based on research, including uh, what Leonie and her team have found out, so that we can ensure a realistic portrayal. So this morning, when Tina came down for breakfast, her smart speakers started playing threatening, expletive-filled tirades. This has happened before and is starting to really upset Tina. Her ex-partner set them up and Tina can't work out how to remove his control. She thinks she's probably going to have to throw the speakers away. After taking her children to school, Tina then heads to a new cafe she found online. And while waiting for her friend, Tina's ex-partner turns up unexpectedly and causes an awful scene. She has no idea how he found her but he's been monitoring Tina's search history via her cloud accounts and tracking her location with the car app. The friend she was meant to meet never turns up. And when Tina calls, her friend says that she received a message from Tina the night before on social media, canceling the date. Tina's ex still has access to her account on his phone and deleted the message after sending it. So Tina couldn't see it in her history. To top it off, Tina then receives a notification from her banking app with details of a new incoming transaction. She discovers that her partner has transferred a few pennies to her account with a vile message in the transaction description. Tina goes home feeling depressed, isolated and scared. How 
is her ex-partner still controlling her even after she made him leave. And Tina is a victim of technology facilitated abuse and she's not alone. An Australian survey of domestic violence support workers found an almost complete overlap between technology abuse and domestic abuse, with over 99% saying they had clients who had experienced technology facilitated abuse. And the insidious thing about this form of abuse is that victims simply cannot escape the omnipresent gaze and judgment of their abuser, as technology is everywhere and entwined with pretty much everything in our society. So victims of this kind of abuse feel like they're under constant surveillance, they feel vulnerable, powerless, and they feel like nowhere is safe. Thanks, Leslie. Now, um, maybe I can come straight away to, to Emma, because obviously you deal with people probably on a day to day basis in these sorts of situations. Those things presumably ring very true with you. Yeah, absolutely. It sounded like similar cases that we've supported. And I think the most difficult thing for women when they come to us is they say, my partner set up my device. I don't have admin access to make any changes to the accounts. To try and find the evidence that this is happening is incredibly difficult. To try and piece everything together when he's making so many different changes. So she thinks she's understood that it's the Wi-Fi. So she's trying to collate that evidence for the police, but then he's changed it and he's moved to another device within the home. So then she starts to try and trace that and find some evidence to collate again for the police. And he again changes to something else. And she reports that to the police and children's services and say that this is still persistent, is still harassing me. And then he turns it around and says that she's crazy and that she's at risk to herself and her children. And we're seeing increasingly more and more women being put through mental health assessments. And unfortunately, a few have been sectioned as well because of the level of abuse. And that is that misuse of technology where perpetrators have the ability and the knowledge to be able to manipulate the devices in such a manner. And for somebody that's within the home that isn't very tech savvy and doesn't have that admin control and hasn't brought the devices, doesn't have you know, access to the phone provider, isn't able to make any changes because she's not the bill payer, that puts her in a really vulnerable position. And it's really terrifying for a lot of women. They report to us that the fear that they feel about speaking to anybody and engaging with agencies it's another barrier now for women to pick up that phone and speak to people for support because it's not just the phone that potentially could be compromised they're looking around the house and thinking is something in this house listening to me I'm probably not safe to have a conversation and speak to somebody on a helpline or call the police because if he hears that conversation that increases my level of risk very interesting. Thank you. Now, uh, interesting that Leslie just quoted that study as well for us there, that there's a 99% crossover with, uh, well, I, I don't want to use the term, uh, general uh, domestic abuse, let's say, and tech um, uh, uh, generates or tech facilitates the abuse. So, Leonie, can we come to you and just get a little bit more on that academic side? Is there been research on of that sort in the, in the UK, for example? Yeah, I mean, like refuge um, uh, are really at the forefront here in the UK because they are a dedicated, like they have a dedicated service and a really good reporting system that also allows them to quantify the scale of this. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, the same is not applicable across the UK. So we really lack kind of a widespread statistic that doesn't cover specific services such as refuge who have this dedicated tick, tick box, so to say, and then follow up questions on the extent of tech which gives us the nuance we need to understand to which devices, which manufacturers, in what forms are the devices being abused. And unfortunately, that is not something that is uh, nationally or across the UK even like um, implemented. For example, we don't have statistics in the UK crime, uh, uh, England and Wales crime survey, um, where you know we have information about domestic abuse, but not on like issues that like give the nuance to the extent of technology being uh, uh, misused. So there's definitely a gap and, and there's something from a policy perspective where, you know, uh, regulators could enforce, for example, a requirement to um, change risk assessments such as like being used across the UK when it comes to working with victims and survivors to explicitly ask for technology. So would, that would allow us then to, for example, have widespread quantifiable information. With that being said, you know, 
uh, uh, organizations like Refuge, but also the Susie Lampluff Trust, which is a national stocking organization, have put forward numbers. And of course, I mean, the Susie Lampluff Trust, uh, most recently, I think it was the, the study this year, said like 100% of their cases have a cyber element. Now, I think for the audience, it's really important to recognize when we talk about cyber or digital or tech, that's a really big bucket, right? And I think the problem is we don't have this nuance that like, you know, we would need to understand, okay, is it conventional smartphones and what on the smartphone is the problem? And I know Emma and her team have more details around this because they gather this information. Um, so for example, when it comes to this big bucket of tech abuse or online violence or cyber violence, people account for excessive text messaging as one form of tech abuse. But then we also have more sophisticated forms, such as, for example, people actually using hacker for hires or, for example, um, using, you know, stalkerware or IoT devices. Uh, what is important to recognize is uh, for the audience here that, like, the average tech abuser, the average domestic abuser is what we call a UA uh, bound abuser. So what that means is they're using the user interface. So they're not like, you know, perhaps we would like to envision kind of a James Bond-esque person that like hacks into something, but most likely they're using the features that are on the phone or any low hanging fruit that is easily available. So that's one important aspect. And to contextualize what Leslie and Emma are, have referred to, you know, that really is this gaslighting element that is really there with technology because one is not sure. And let's be honest, there's a gendered dimension here as well. Um, you know, uh, women are still in a society less uh, inclined to use technology, to purchase it, to maintain it and to delete or, or work with it. So if you think about like, you know, having a partner that has set up these devices that the legal account holder and, you know, you, this, this is a topic that has gone probably since your childhood. Like I know my brother was always the one who got the PC. I just got the leftovers. And like, so um, when that comes to the question of like, am I certain that something is happening with my router, with my phone? you know, you really start to become really paranoid and that's the gaslighting element where you might sound absolutely ludicrous to another person, but you might feel, and perhaps it's real really, that like someone has installed stockware on your phone, but you can't be certain. And that's really the problem, uh, with, especially as we're moving into more internet connected society. And I tend to say this and I feel like I'm a broken record, but in this environment where we're at now, where the overestimation of the capabilities of technologies is as dangerous as the underestimation, because the underestimation means domestic abuse victims are not aware of what could happen to them or what is happening to them because they don't know that there's a video functionality, an audio recording functionality, a drop-in function, et cetera. Whereas the overestimation means we have all these adverts on TV saying our toothbrushes are AI, you know, supported and God knows what, and we have the Black Mirror episodes on the BBC. And like, you know, we envision tech being actually further away than or further ahead of where, where we really are. And I think, you know, that gives domestic abusers also the ability to say, you know, you might not know it, but you know, we ha have these tiny sensors in the house that can do this and that. That might not actually be true, or it might be a technology that exists, but like very unlikely the have, have been purchased by this person, but nevertheless, they can use those claims to equally intimidate that both with the same outcome of people, of victims being intimidated, of being insecure and feeling entrapped. Uh, that is a very interesting perspective. Um, but specifically on the vectors uh, technology wise, then Emma, uh, uh, Leonie mentioned that uh, perhaps your organization have done a bit of research into that. Are there some that are more common vectors than others? For example, you mentioned smart, smart speakers, is it more IoT devices? Maybe they're not as locked down. Is, is, is it phones that are more likely to be the uh, uh, the route for these things? Or what's your perspective on that? I think, I think you're exactly right. What you've just mentioned there is we get referrals come through to us. And the amount of times that I read the referral and it says my phone has been, my SIM card's been cloned or my phone's been cloned. And it's like, that probably hasn't happened. It may have happened, but let's try and eliminate the other things first. So it's thinking about what is the most common devices that she's using, applications, apps, accounts that she has and eliminating them. So we go through a checklist with them to make sure that we're covering absolutely everything. Cause there's always something potentially that she's forgotten about. Maybe an old iPhone in the drawer that she hasn't realized is still connected to the perpetrator's phone. 
maybe there's a synced account, maybe she hasn't changed a password for something a while back. So we eliminate them first before we jump straight through to it's stalkware, it's spyware, it's a clone SIM card. They, they do happen. We do have some very tech savvy perpetrators that have managed to create an environment for the victim where everything is monitored and tracked and the cases are very complex but they are probably 5% of our cases. The rest is the everyday items that are misused. And I think there is an increase in the home devices. We're seeing that as more and more products are on the market, more and more people are purchasing them. More people now own a smart TV than from 18 months ago. So naturally we're seeing more cases where smart TVs are an issue. Same with ring doorbells, smart speakers, et cetera. Okay, interesting. Um, I've just seen a hand in the, uh, in, in the audience there. Uh, folks, if you have a a question or a point to make please put it in the Q&A because we don't uh, we don't take hands actually live from the audience uh, during the broadcast so uh, if you could just use the Q&A button at the bottom that'd be uh, brilliant thank you very much uh, Leslie can I come to you about the hardware side of things as well uh, your perspective on, um, on maybe those more likely access points yes and, and it's a really good point that of course the you know the devices the applications that are more in the hands of us in day-to-day -day life are probably more likely to be used. However, I think that basically any technology that interacts with humans actually uses their data or influences decisions about and for people could potentially be manipulated for harm. And that perspective is possibly more about the designing of products. And that's why I think it's quite important to point that out. And also I wanna point out that the use of technology for control and monitoring can be very nuanced and sneaky, basically. I mean, because like we said before, perpetrators of domestic abuse are awfully creative at repurposing functionality within even the most honorable of technologies. And that goes back to what Leone was saying about how it is standard functionality with standard logins. They're not hacking in and be becoming root. They're just using what's given to them. And it isn't always overt, and it can be opportunistic, the low hanging fruit, and pieces of data from a plethora of sources can be used. So I'll quickly run through a few examples. So there is enabling location tracking in ebook readers. I never thought of that before. Monitoring purchases via prepaid cards that people might give for, you know, alimony or, or child benefits or anything like that. Tracking battery device levels so that they know that you're ignoring their messages, sharing horrendous files on file storage systems, monitoring property records to see whether or not you've moved, and even, I think this is awful, monitoring school portals for children's sport schedules to determine your location. And so it's just awful. And, the, and those are examples of one-step processes, but abusers can also be willing to take multiple steps to achieve their malicious aim. And I'll give you another example. It, it's slightly more complicated, but most email clients will allow you to set up the forwarding of emails. So a copy of any email you receive is sent to another address. And we looked at one particular client and it would present you a notification banner every time you log in to inform you that forwarding had been enabled, but it was only present for seven days. There were no reminders after that. And the only way to find out if your email was being forwarded was to dig through the configuration and find an item that was called pop slash IMAP forwarding. Now, while you and I may know what those protocols are for, I'm not sure many non-technical people would. And this example ties in with the fact that abusive partners have been known to buy phones and set them up for their partner. And in that situation, it wouldn't be difficult to enable email forwarding, wait seven days, and then gift the phone. And the abuser could even deviously encourage the recipient to change their password while in the background or their email is being forwarded to another account. Now, that type of technology manipulation could be quite difficult to detect. But going back to design, <laughs> if the designers of that particular email client had ensured that users were presented with ongoing reminders of the email forwarding, and they used accessible language in their config settings, it would probably dissuade the perpetrator from enabling email forwarding in the first place. 
Uh, that is a very interesting point. You, and you listed some stuff there that I, <laughs> likewise, not really uh, considered. I mean, monitoring school schedules uh, is a whole other level of of darkness perhaps, isn't it? But you could see how that would work. So uh, let, let me ask a question then of, of the whole panel. And I know this is not in our in our list of questions, so we'll have to just go with me on this if you if you don't mind. Um, are there ways of flagging uh, some of those? Um, Leslie, you talked about the language, first of all, being, being rather opaque and techy, using the term, you know, IMAP and the public accounts and all, all, all the rest of it is not very helpful. Is it, ma is it a matter of almost having in, in the um, quite easily discoverable settings menus, something, some sort of labeling as as to uh, these are these are potential things that could be could be infiltrated in some way. Is that a way to approach this? And perhaps Leonie would have a view on that from from the academic perspective. Um, so I mean. So we have been, so we did tests with IoT devices as well. And, and we, we basically approached it as if we were really nasty people, how would we misuse that? Which is kind of devious, but it's, it's a good way to go about with when it comes to threat modeling. So um, I think the core thing, especially when it comes to IoT devices is prompt and notification. It sounds super simple, but it's like, that's what's missing. So um, uh, to, to follow the example of Leslie and give, an, uh, give, a, a, give a, not too much detail, but like some information, what I mean with that, how often have we connected to systems or lock, you know, been at a friend's house, locked into a certain account, left the house and forgot that you still locked into a certain like kind of either your email client or, or another setting. And like, um, you know, with certain, you know, nowadays what I, again, conventional old fashioned things like, you know, with email clients, we have already like learned that there's a, they're really critical because with your email, you have access route to everything, right? Your, your different accounts, your, your banking, whatever. But like, so certain platforms like Dropbox as well. Um, so cloud storage have learned over the years, not just from, from a domestic abuse perspective, but from economic abuse and other things. Okay. Perhaps you should give like people reminder of like, you have logged into your account here or whatnot but the same thing with we don't for example have currently with iot devices so this is why we're, we're, where our research was kind of like very keen on like these devices are entering the market they're becoming more widespread they are often even embedded in the physical infrastructure so it, we would like to be proactive and that not just as we have done with the past with much of the internet, like learn reactively what we should have embedded, but before we release it, better implement that. So prompt and notification would be one thing that would be so quick and simple to implement. It would require, you know, like um, devices to simply prompt the user and say, by the way, you have like two weeks ago or two months ago connected to this device, let's say from your Amazon Echo to your thermostat. Do you still want to be connected to that? Or also like, odd things like, you know, um, nowadays, I, I, I hear I say it, I don't know if we have many IoT developers in the audience, but like, I consider IoT devices not very smart at this moment of time, but rather dumb, because they often require kind of like a user to, to use an app or, or give prompts, but they will be smart in the future. But at this moment of time, you know, there's a lot of re reliance on this device here. Um, so uh, again, like, if there's central nodes such as the phone, such as a smart speaker, that they have a responsibility to actually kind of also monitor the environment that is in there, which I also acknowledge gives a lot of power to these central nodes, meaning Amazon with its Google Echo, uh, sorry, with this Echo, um, Google with its Google Home and all the other providers of these smart speakers. So, um, but, but basically, I think prompt and notification would be one easy way of like remembering people, oh, I'm still logged into my friend's account uh, on this. I want to remove that. Logs are really important. Now, logs are both good and bad, and we will, we will not come across this like, um, or we will not remove this dual use problem uh, of devices. But logs, because what Emma said, a lot of uh, abuse victims are struggling to extract information that they can use in a court case. Um, and to make it possible for them to, you know, um, be able to, to quickly receive kind of information who has been accessing my device when, just like with, we have with, for example, like a history of, of your internet browsing search, that would be information for them to go and say, look, uh, there has this external device on this day at this time been accessing my account. And, and yeah, visual reminders, definitely. 
but um, I think also important for anyone who, in the, who is in the audience and provides you know, device system services to users, customer staff, facing staff guidance. So have you thought about the fact that you may be approached by a domestic abuse victim or by a support service like Refuge and ask for help? And how are you escalating things? How are you applying to this? How are you verifying that this is not the abuser perhaps asking for something? So these are some of the um, suggestions I would leave with the audience. Uh, very interesting, uh, Leonie. Thank you. I, I, a lot of these things also seem to come back down to who has the um, the administration rights on on the accounts. Can I come to Emma on that particular issue? Because obviously they're there for a reason, um, yeah. but they're very susceptible to misuse in this context, aren't they? They are, and I think that is a big issue that predominantly perpetrators have set the accounts up. And a lot of accounts only allow one person to have admin access and be the, so for instance, with iPhone, family sharing allows one person to make the changes, remove somebody, add features, et cetera. So that's one person that can have overriding ability to change functions where I think it needs an option to have somebody else as well. And I think what you were just saying there at the end is really key is, victims will come to you they do go to apple they do contact their providers and say i need help and support and it's about what is your response and that's really key and central it's about allowing them the ability to collate the evidence to pass that over to them to help them navigate that setting to make the information transparent as well because i find a lot of the time when we're looking for guides and resources the information is really hidden. You have to really unpick it. I speak to different providers and they say, oh, we have got a guidance for domestic violence victims. And it's great when I see it, but it's nowhere to be found. It's like it's really difficult to actually find the information. So it needs to be the first thing that people see and make sure that information is generic as well. So you're not thinking... Um, because we had somebody come to us and say, if we can identify the people that are victims, shall we send them something? It's like, no, because you would put them at risk. It's like your information needs to be generic for everybody. So then he's not going to be alerted to that you're receiving advice because you've notified somebody you're a victim. It's just generic advice that's out there for everybody because we recognise that domestic violence is a huge issue for everybody. Um, and it affects many, many women. I think one in six women in, in the country are a victim of domestic violence at, at some point in their lifetime. So that generic advice is really important. And it's about making sure that everything is accessible for people as well. And similar to the email settings, a key thing that we find as well is auto password saving features within devices as well. So laptops, computers, phones. That happens as well. A woman will go onto a perpetrator's phone or a perpetrator will go into a woman's phone. And if they change that feature, then they have access to all of their accounts afterwards. And you'll never be notified because there's no notifications. So it's things like that. When people are developing features for ease, it's like, well, what are the consequences after that? That's very interesting. Thank you. So perhaps I can just come back to this about this, this whole idea of get, people getting some uh, support to actually find evidence uh, after after the these events, so we, we were talking about um, uh, you know logs and if you're if you're tech savvy, you can find that sort of thing. Uh, if you're not, and also if you're in this very difficult emotional and, and potentially physical situation, um, you know, is it, there's not enough support being given. What support should be given? So that's a really good point, and it's the audit trail almost the you know making it clear who has done what. Is, is really key and it, it shouldn't be necessarily hidden away in logs. We might still, or sorry, we, if someone is trying to prosecute a case, that kind of data I am sure is very important. So it should be collected. It doesn't necessarily have to be complex and uh, given to a user in that form, but it should be clear and obvious who was taking what stuff when. So have they deleted messages? Make it obvious that a message is de deleted, I think in the example we gave earlier. And all these, and then you know something strange has happened. I can't, I don't have to doubt my memories because the evidence is there. And then if you need to dig, you can get the actual details that can then be presented for court cases or whatever, or to the police. But yeah, it, it's a really big problem. And I know, I think I've been told things like screenshots, for example, aren't admissible um, as evidence and things like that. So absolutely, it is a big area that tech companies could help with for sure. Um, but it's a balance, isn't it? We don't want to um, bombard with a whole load of techie information, but we want people to know the evidence can be gathered if they need it. Um, so that would be my point, really. 
Lovely, thank you. Now, uh, 35 minutes are shot by there. We usually make these 45, so we've got 10 left. <laughs> in this last 10, I'd just like to uh, ask you uh, folks individually uh, to give your views on the top tips uh, for things that need to be uh, thought through. I'd just like to make one observation myself, and I wonder if I just got the right angle on this, that it seems to be there's a mid-level of, of reporting required for people to, to, to reveal some of the things that are going on in the deeper workings of their phone. Uh, you were talking about alerts for certain things. It seems to me also, Leslie, from what you were saying, if some people had some idea of what was going on in the logs, uh, they'd also be a little bit more informed and there might be some more functionality there. Now, that, that's just my thinking, so feel free to correct that. Perhaps I can come to you uh, one at a time on the top tips for product design with personal safety in mind. Can I ask Leonie first? Yeah, um, so I mean, like the, the first thing is, um, so we, we, we have been very adamant um, with, uh, uh, with trying to educate not just um, policy officials, but also the industry sector, not with much success, I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, 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 with the exception of IBM, uh, I think we had not much interaction with others that were very keen on speaking to us. And I think um, perhaps like the simple rule is like, be open to failure and like to acknowledge that like your devices may not be perfect. I know PR wise, this is not great, but I think the long-term impact is far worse. Like uh, the best example I can give is I was on a phone trying to get a very big IoT vendor to come to a, a panel discussion that we were organizing. And like on the phone, this person was telling me, well, of course it's just one representative out of a big organization. Basically we're not designing the devices to be misused. So, you know, like basically, you know, that's, that wasn't our, it's not our fault, our responsibility whatsoever. And I think, you know, that is really shameful. And I think like, it's important to recognize as we have been banging on throughout this seminar and, and for, for very much, lots of the decade is that like devices, you know, will be misused one way or another. So just like be acknowledged about it and accept that and, and try to mitigate that. So that's my first thing. Then the thing is, I, I think it's important for designers to have this kind of um, emerging understanding of like intimate threat model. We just recently published a paper around this, but like just thinking about the way we educate, for example, students and designers, uh, future designers, like we're thinking always about external threat actors, you know, like a terrorist, a criminal, like we have perhaps like an insider threat when it comes to business, but we never consider the house, which is actually statistically, especially for women, the riskiest place to be, the domestic space as a risk place. But I think it's important to start modeling for this new emerging, well, it's not a new threat, it, uh, just an existing threat that we have completely been ignoring uh, and consider the devices, which is really important, I wanna say, in light of our move away from individual devices, so each one has one of those, to shared devices. And I think that is really the challenge that we need to communicate that like sharing devices is a completely new way of like modeling for risk. And I think we're still not far away ahead in, in regards to how are we navigating like different user permission, account holders, et cetera. So, a couple of pointers for those of you who are interested. So there's a lot of work by the eSafety Commissioner in Australia. They have a design guidance, for example, that I, I, I point out. Of course, uh, IBM has also five principles. Leslie can talk about this as well. And most recently, um, uh, there is a book published called Design for Safety um, uh, by Eva Penze Moog that is also trying to give key consideration for, 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 for designers when it comes to that. And there's a product life cycle she highlights like how to go about this. But what I also want to stress for anyone listening in is, and I think what Emma just said is so important. Like, don't go away thinking you have the solution, implement it, and then be surprised that it doesn't work. The only way you can be effective in navigating these emerging, again, not emerging, these risks is working with the sector because the sector knows what's happening. So not talking with them is like, you know, basically, you're working with a patient and not asking the patient where the pain is, you know? Um, so I think it's important to, that there are these synergies with the sector, with academia, and to be open to collaboration and also to open to be failing, you know? Lovely. Thank you, Lini. Emma, can I come to you and ask what, what you consider the top tips from your perspective to be? Yeah, I think I fully agree with everything that you've just mentioned there. I think what I see, which is really disappointing, is the responsibility lies with the victim at the moment, and we need to shift away from that. 
there's the victim's responsibility to find evidence. It's the victim's responsibility to make her devices safer, you know, to stop this abuse from happening. No other form of abuse that you would report to the police would you be expected to find the evidence before you present yourself to make a report. And yet with tech abuse it is, and that's becoming the norm and that shouldn't happen. And so I think there's lots of education there that not just tech developers, police, criminal justice system need to be, be getting their head around this emerging trend of tech abuse and what is happening with victims. And I think for me, one thing that I see all of the time that really concerns me is the normalization of tracking and monitoring. So as you were just saying, like at the moment, it's devices on our own, but it's them shared devices. And we're really seeing an increase in that where people are saying, what's the best app to monitor my child with? What's the best tracking device to monitor my partner with? And it's that normalization that it's okay to monitor and track everybody within the home. And I think we need to move away from that because then that normalization it prevents victims from reaching out for support because it's normalised that form of abuse. I spoke to one lady who had had webcams in her home. The whole house was rigged with tech. She was being constantly recorded and monitored in every room. And that went on for 15 years. And she never spoke to anyone for support because everyone around her told her it was normal. So that's what we're moving into. That's the, another barrier for victims seeking support. So it's that this shouldn't be normalised victims shouldn't be responsible and when we go to tech developers it's not an attack we're not saying we don't like your product we're not saying that it's a problem we just acknowledge that we can see how perpetrators are misusing them devices and like you were saying it's about come to us before come to people like the UCL like IBM and ask them we're developing this product we're in the very early stages where do you think there could be elements that a perpetrator is going to misuse this and we can give you advice and say that element right there, that is going to be misused. This is how I would tweak it. It probably won't be foolproof, but it might be better than what's on the market in 12 months time. And then we're going to be coming to you saying there's a problem. That's really interesting. Thank you. So that offer was uh, loud and clear there. Thank you, Emma, very much. Uh, Leslie. So I think I'm probably going to echo what Emma <laughs> and Leonie say, but the most important thing is that developers, designers, technologists, whoever it is, recognize that their technology can be manipulated for harm and once that's in their heads and our heads we can all take steps to deny those manipulations now I have to say I don't think we will ever get away from the need to take steps to ensure our online security but it shouldn't be difficult and technologists need to make sure as Emma said that the burden of safety doesn't fall solely on the shoulders of the end user. And from my perspective, that is where thoughtful design comes in. And this kind of echoes again what Leonie was saying, but just as technology designers and developers put on imaginary hackers hats, seeing their product through the eyes of a hacker to pinpoint security threats and potential vulnerabilities, so too should they put on an abuser's hat. By doing so and focusing on the intent of the abuser, technologists can then think of ways that their tech might be leveraged to realize a malicious aim against an individual rather than an organization. And once those threats have been modeled, it should then be possible to start looking at ways of designing tech to thwart those aims. And typically, that's probably gonna be about balancing the intended with the unintended consequences of our tech. And unfortunately, it probably won't be easy, but as Emma said, talking to experts like Emma and Leone, you can start on that path towards making our tech safer by design. Thank you, uh, Lizzie. Now, I know IBM have a, a very strong responsible computing strand, don't they? I think that's what you, you even call these, um, these things. I'm, I'm just wondering whether uh, there's a, a larger point here just about our view of innovation. You mentioned it right at the outset that we should just take a step back. It's not about moving fast and breaking things, as somebody once rather famously said. Is there an argument there as well, just to take it easy a little bit with the innovation speed? Absolutely. And, and we are. We all want the shiny, the new, the exciting. But like I said at the beginning, take that step back, look at the bigger picture and think about not just the happy paths, think of how it could be 
And it, this isn't just about domestic abuse, this can be used in all sorts of cases because coercive control is a problem in other types of relationships because it's all about a power imbalance. So examples could be between carers and the vulnerable or elderly, um, even in institutions. So think about our products before we release them. Develop that shiny, amazing brand new thing, but look at it through the lens of coercive control and, and think about how we can improve it. Lovely. Thank you. Now, just to pick up one final point, actually, uh, Leonie just put this in my mind uh, that people might view it as a PR disaster uh, if something comes out that it, you know, this is no good, this being misused. Perhaps that's down to organisations like us to actually recast that argument to say, actually, if somebody, if a, if a product designer comes out and says, actually, this is a problem, this is what we did about it, we should actually be saying, actually, that's a brave thing to do. Thank you for pointing it out and, uh, and moving the conversation onwards rather than trying to hide it away. Um, I, I, that's uh, our three quarters of an hour, just a little bit more than uh, gone. And can I just say, um, really enjoyed uh, talking to all three of you today. The last time we covered this subject in any depth was about 18 months ago after an event that IBM ran, which I think all four of us were probably at. Uh, about coercive control and I wrote a piece following that so it's been a bit perhaps a bit too long for us because BCS are about making IT good for society so we won't leave it quite so long to cover the subject again so uh, can I say uh, thank you very much Leslie thank you Leonie and uh, thank you Emma thank you to the audience and uh, we look forward to seeing maybe some comments on, on the YouTube channel later as well thank you